Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U at Filmmaker U. We create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Every week I interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week I'm joined by cinematographer James Neist, uh, whose work includes uh, Annabelle, Haunting of Bly Manor, and of course, Hush, which I loved, uh, among many other great films and TV shows. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Uh, I guess the first, my first question for you, is you also did stuff on Midnight Mass, which we were talking about a bit before here. Um, what was your involvement with that? How did, how did you get going on that show? Um, well, I had been kind of, you know, over the years working a bit with them in the Mike Flanagan, Trevor Macy, Intrepid camp. Um, and right on the tails of uh, The Haunting of Blind Manor, came back the, the following um, year to do Midnight Mass. And Michael Fuminiori, who is a longtime collaborator with Mike, uh, he was shooting it as a DP, but he had some other conflicts with schedule. Um, and so he had to leave periodically and I would come in and, and basically take over for him while he was gone. So throughout the season, um, I would be there several times um, for you know anywhere from a few days to, to a couple of weeks. Uh, and it was interesting because it was during COVID time. So every time I'd go up there, I'd have to quarantine again. Uh, and then we had, you know, all the, all the PPE constraints of shooting. And, and this was really one of the first shows that was up and running uh, in, in terms of production during, you know, the apex of COVID. Uh, and so it was really stringent and, and, you know, really strict in terms of the protocols. How did you kill time if you're quarantining every, every time you go up there? You know, um, I was I was actually pretty daunted by it. The, the first, you know, as it was approaching, I'd see that for that I quarantined four times. So two months of my life, I was I was quarantined. Um, the first time I did it, the, I I got a, a house that was kind of out in the suburbs. It had a backyard and a pool. And it was summertime, and um, brought my golf clubs and I could putt and chip. And then realistically, you know, there's so much prep work that goes into these shows that there's a lot of scripts to read. There's a lot of equipment to go through. Um, there's you know staffing requirements to figure out and then and then just reading the the material rereading the material digesting it uh and then you know a lot of reference stuff too so it kind of keeps you really busy you know i, I also made quite a bit of a, a thing about eating you know i would take me 25 minutes to make a sandwich i'd cut the tomatoes perfectly and, you know just to try to eat up the clock a little bit um but it really and really it really isn't that bad and now too with with our technology you know i i have a daughter and i was able to do homework with her over facetime and um, and so you still have that connectivity where, you know, a few years back, we wouldn't have had that and, and it would have been phone calls and it's just not quite the same. So it's great to be able to see your family's faces when, when you're away. Now you've worked on a lot of horror films or suspense films. Um, as a cinematographer, what is something you learned doing this genre that young uh, cinematographers should know about? I think one of the most interesting things that I've learned in the in the horror genre, which you know now I've really come to believe is a huge incorporates a huge swath of material, um, is is that our audiences are, are you know really sophisticated now, and and especially as like Western filmmakers or American filmmakers, I think in the past we've had a tendency to really show everything or tell the story you know from all the different angles. Where I think some of the other you know cultures maybe were were a little bit more subtle and they left holes in it for the audience to to fill in and. And I think so one of the most important things as cinematographer is, is feeling confident not showing or not necessarily lighting or lensing everything or framing everything in the story and letting those um, elements be a little bit of a mystery and letting um, maybe the audience just be, you know, just hinting at them. And I think that lends itself to a little, I'm so sorry, it lends itself to, um, to more of the mystery and the suspense. Uh, and, and when people don't, aren't really quite sure what's there, and you, you can see them in some of the testing I've done in, in audiences. You can see them physically trying to peer around a corner or staring into the darkness. And um, so it's been kind of fun in terms of learning how to let things fall away. Don't really, you know, hit things on the nose so much. And, and I think it's a conversation that we're always having with the directors and the writers and producers is how much do we show? Mm -hmm. 
what is it like watching your films with an audience that would be like surreal but also amazing at the same time like it's such an interesting experience so yeah it's like, yeah you know. it's um it's a little bit daunting and unnerving in the sense that you're not sure how people are going to react and, and we pour our hearts and souls into these projects and um I've been very fortunate that that most everything that I've been a part of has been well received, but going into it and, and being in the theater with either a test audience or just watching it, you know, um, with the everyday audience, I'm always worried what people are going to say because people are really, it's easy to criticize things, armchair quarterback stuff. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, I think the genre audiences are really, really supportive and I've really been um, surprised to continually feel that support. Um, not only as a filmmaker, but as a as an audience as well, um, is to see the community there and the support that they have, and um, it's pretty forgiving to some degree. Is there a particular style of uh, horror that you're attracted to? Like, do you prefer the ghosts or the you know monster films or anything on a personal level? Surprisingly enough, I'm, I'm not that attracted to like monster <laughs> films and and slasher type stuff. I'm mm -hmm. I'm more interested and in, um, kind of moved by. The mystery and the intrigue and, and um, things where um, there's a story that you're trying to figure out throughout the ride. And I think that, that for me, that engages me mentally. And, and I'm not, I don't really need the visceral kind of scare things. Um, and sometimes I, I think they can be a tad bit gratuitous. Um, but I know that a lot of people like that. So I, I think that it's important to kind of cover all those bases and intersperse it as long as it's not, you know, over the top or too on the nose. It's a good thing you got uh, got teamed up with Mike. <laughs> yes, because he's uh, that's his style by the looks of it. Absolutely. Um, now, what what are some of the challenges on uh, for let's say like a show like uh, The Haunting of Bly Manor or Midnight Mass um, that sort of I guess the challenges that you you face but that you overcame and you were really pleased with in terms of getting a particular look or or style for the film or show? Yeah, I think that um, the cool thing about, you know, like for instance, Midnight Mass is it all happens in the same environment, the same time period. So it's some continuity through, through all throughout that story. Um, I, I find it's fun when there's some variety in the look and the time period and, and, and maybe the locations um, in a show because it just lends itself to a fresh perspective all the time and fresh problem solving uh, and, and I think that makes it a little bit easier because there's room to make adjustments when you're trying to really adhere to some sort of continuity throughout, the, you know, maybe you're, you're shooting throughout the winter that turns into spring or vice versa. And you're having kind of weather conflicts and maybe you're shooting one scene one day and you come back to shoot the second part of that scene weeks later, but now the, the trees have either lost their leaves or they're blooming and it's sunny out. Those things technically from a cinematographer standpoint can be you know, challenging for sure and frustrating, you know, pull your hair out. And, and even working in like um, places where most of these shows have been taking places in Vancouver, you know, the weather can change drastically throughout the day and um, clouds can move in and you're trying to really maintain some continuity in terms of the lighting and the light direction um, and the feel and even things like, you know, you're on one side and it's really calm. And then by the time you shoot the other side of the, the scene, it's windy and now the trees are moving behind the other person and you don't necessarily notice it while you're shooting it, but in the edit, you really see a difference. So it's tracking those kind of things can be really challenging. I think for me, um, the episodic world can be challenging because especially working with, you know, some of Mike's projects, there's a lot of depth in them and um, we're up against the clock constantly. And you want to give, at least me, one of my motivators is to give the director and the actors as much time as possible in front of the camera to do different takes, to try different <clears throat> approaches to the material possibly and oftentimes we're really up against it in the clock so it's it's like you kind of got to hustle and um so that can be challenging especially when you have scripts that really have a lot of meat to them <clears throat> and you want to really give them the opportunity to dig in and and explore that stuff so that's that's a really big challenge and you know and I think the directors and producers have such high aspirations that you're really trying to fit all this into a to a um, manageable day and a manageable schedule and a lot of that's just driven by the studio and budget and not necessarily the material. I mean, maybe one day, you know, be fortunate to be on a project like, well, this looks like a hundred day shoot. <laughs> <laughs> when in fact, we never get that. Yeah. I haven't, yeah. It's fair pro unless you're doing, uh, I guess, a Marvel film. Right. <laughs> right. Are you, um, you, you mentioned sort of, you know, coming back a week later and having it look completely different. 
And in a lot of cases, or in some cases, then you have to rely on visual effects. So like, okay, it was snow here, we need to add snow digitally in post, or how do you, I guess, A, how do you stay on top of that um, in terms of um, building and acquiring that knowledge, especially since something might happen last second that you're, you're not ready for? Things happen last second all the time. I think secretly that's sort of the fun of it, you know, and realistically, that's what we do is we problem solve all day long. And, and there's a, there's a, you know, a, a gratification to that when you're faced with, you know, what you initially would think would be an insurmountable challenge, but then collectively as a team, we figure it out um, on set. Normally we're afforded um, a special effects supervisor, or at least somebody there who can, you know, help offer up what the potential solutions are, you know, in terms of special effects, it's largely driven by money and budget as well. Sometimes you just can't get out of it. Like, um, hmm. you know, midnight mass, there was stuff done on the beach there where there's shipping lanes and the ships were painted out. Um, I had some of those issues again on another series. I just finished up there with Mike um, called the midnight club where, you know, they're supposed to be out in a sort of remote area, but we have city lights in the background and, you know, sometimes cars passing and boats passing. Um, so those, I think, are the, the key is to identify that going in early when you're scouting and prepping that, hey, these are some potential problems that we should budget for now and track and be aware of. We'll do our best to eliminate them, you know, on the day in terms of the angle of the camera and the way we set up the sets, but in, inevitably they're going to happen. Mm -hmm. So they need to get budgeted for so it's not a surprise on the day. Um, and then, you know, again, as a team, we have, we have script supervisors, which help a lot with continuity. Um, nowadays, playback is really easy. So we can, you know, earmark stuff. And when we turn around to look at the other side of the coverage, we can pull that, that shot up again and just make sure that things are feeling good. I do that a lot. And, and even if it's just a still, just to kind of, you know, assuage your fears or just make sure that, okay, yeah, this, this all cuts well. Um, even in, you know, sizes and things like that. Traditionally, we use measurements with distances and lenses, but, um, you know, people can have different shaped bodies and heads. And so sometimes one shot might feel a little bit bigger than the other shot. So it's nice to have those references to, to sort of um, quickly, quickly look at to just make sure that you're on the right page. Um, I think it's so amazing what they can do now digitally. It's incredible. <laughs> I mean, just augmentation alone, it saves us so much time on set, you know, especially with things with like blood and, and, and you know, special effects makeup and things like that, where it, it's really hard to get it, make it seamless, you know, especially when you're blending skin tones and wounds or things like that. And, and now we just really rely a lot on just little cleanups and little things like that. And it's, again, nice to have the, the special effects people on, on set with us so that they can, the visual effects people. So that, um, yeah, that's no problem. Don't worry about it. Don't spend, you know, half an hour trying to fix something when they can go right in and, and, and change it, mm -hmm. even, if, even if it makes a cut. I think that's one of the, the drivers is, you know, we could spend a lot of time on something that might not necessarily make the edit. So let's lean on post help later when it's actually in the project editorially. Now, you, you talked about how amazing it is, what, what we can do with VFX. Have you seen Unreal Engine's MetaHumans yet? Not the metahumans, no. Oh, it's kind of disturbing how, like, it looks like a real human now. <laughs> that... <laughs> like been, I've done a bit of like face replacement and things like yeah. that, which is which you know was mind blowing at the time. Um, and I've done some of the stuff on the Unreal Engine, but not a ton. Um, and it's a little bit scary in terms of a filmmaker, like either a how to adjust with it and grow with it, and, and you know encompass it into your work and not feel like you're getting phased out to some degree. <laughs> and I tell you, young, young artists and young creative people that are looking to get in the business, that, that to me is like the wild, wild west. Like it has tons of potential. And if, if I was a young person getting in the industry, I would really be looking at, um, at that segment for opportunity. Because mm -hmm. there's no real libraries of that stuff. You know, yeah. at least at this point, everything has to be custom made for the project. And so you know, there's, there's a big demand for skilled artists in that arena. Yeah. Uh, how do you like to work with cinematographers to get the look for a show or a movie? I'm or like, sorry, uh, sorry colorists. Oh, with colorists? Um, there's a couple different ways that, that I've done it. I've done it where we don't really even, you know, work together in the beginning at all. And, um, and I shoot it a certain way and really rely on ca in-camera work and lighting and um, color the lighting how I want it as we shoot it, um, light it 
in terms of contrast and darkness and brightness. And then there's been other times when we really work hard with the colorist to build a, a LUT, which is basically um, kind of pre-colored. And, and then that'll really, really inform the look. And we do a lot of testing and I think there's a lot of conversations about it too. There is so much latitude now in our cameras that um, almost too much so, I think, personally. I think it can sometimes be a crutch. We're like, oh yeah, we can, we can pull that out later where, you know, I came up shooting film where it was a lot different, where you really had to nail your exposure and your contrast ratios and stuff like that because there wasn't a lot of wiggle room. Yeah. Or not nearly as much. I mean, there still was quite a bit of wiggle room, but um, I think it depends mostly on the how much time you have in prep. Um, and also how much variation in the show you have, like, you know, if it's kind of all the same setting and the same scene and same locations, I think you can work really hard at really dialing the look previously. But when, you know, you're shooting a series or a show that has a lot of different looks throughout the, the, um, the show, you kind of have to pre-visit and figure out something that, that could work across the board um, and then just shoot it that way and then, you know, kind of fine tune it in post. Um, this last show I did with my the Midnight Club, we had every episode had two stories, the A story, which was congruent all the way through the season. And then these kids would meet and, and talk about um, ghost stories or tell stories. And so each story was a standalone kind of look and feel. And so there was a lot of variation, you know. Um, and so you can work with a colorist, which I did because we had the lead time is like for this, you know, scene, it's the 1940s. So let's develop a look that that is, you know, desaturated and slightly sepia and kind of just harkens back to that era. Um, so we would build LUTs and then on set, normally we have a DIT that we can kind of do live grade and, and tweak those, those LUTs. And you have to be careful though, because if you get too many kind of looks, it can get um, slightly cumbersome and a little bit heavy lifting for the post house to track all the time, especially in dailies when you're not there to make sure that it's right. There's, there's, um, you know, just a night person usually running it and it's three o'clock in the morning and to ask them to, you know, shot by shot manage the look is, is a little bit um, of, of a big ass tall order. Um, so there's, there's quite a different ways. And I think it's really driven by how much prep time you have, how much money you have, your relationship with the colorist. And I think your comfort level on set with how much you can control through, just changing the color temperature on the camera and managing your lighting. Now, you your work, one of the things I really appreciate is, so in horror shows or scary shows, there's a lot of dark scenes. And I find that a lot of cinematographers, it just drops off and you can't see detail and you can't see things. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it's how you work with Mike, like it's lit so it feels dark but you can still see everything which sounds like a weird compliment to make like i can see it <laughs> um, i'll take it but i'm wondering like how do you approach dark scenes like i think about in midnight mass where they come across the beach at night and i'm like you could lose the detail in the water or you could lose like there's all these little uh things that we could lose easily especially with people not calibrating their tvs properly well, that's a whole nother wrinkle, especially now. I mean, there's so many devices that, that people watch um, content on from their phones to their iPads to their, you know, 65 or 85 inch TV, um, not necessarily in the best viewing environment. And, and so, you know, that's that's always been a question of mine is like, what do we what's our target? I kind of have landed on the fact that we're going to light, shoot and expose for the best viewing environment so that things don't look too bright. You know, I'd almost rather err on the other side where things are a little bit dark and mysterious and the person that's watching on the, their iPhone on the bus might not be able to see it. But when somebody's watching it in a you know, home theater or even at the theaters, that's when it really wants to, to feel cinematic. Yeah, uh, like, like your work in Bly Manor where we had the black and white stuff, there was mm -hmm. like a texture to it and like you could make out nice details in the blacks. It was just worked really well. Yeah, I'm just always um, have an eye constantly looking for that, you know, that balance and that subtlety, like you want it to feel heavy and you want it to feel weighted. But I also make a joke oftentimes that the producers are paying these actors and paying for these locations and sets. They want to see them. So it's for me, I'm always evaluating that that soft roll off into darkness. Um, and then, you know, I think it's important to 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 build light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, so that there's a sense of depth in, in the scenes and in doing so. It may feel really dark, but then in the, you know, the, the, the distance, there's another light source or another pool or shaft of light that 
kind of builds this depth and makes it not feel super dark, but there is definitely, um, or at least I'm always trying to aspire to have, you know, a sense of weight to the images. I, I really am motivated to make them feel cinematic and rich um, and, and, you know, not over lit. And I, I'm constantly trying to get better and better at that, making it feel really natural and not, not so artificial or studio-esque, you know? Um, but I do tease times like I, I just like to do a romantic comedy and put the light right next to the camera. Um, <laughs> just a really light kidding, around the camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm really only kidding because I don't really want to. But um, no, I, it's something that's really important to me actually is, is, is trying to achieve that um, cinematic sense of, you know, tonality. Coming up, learning photography the traditional way. You know, we worked in the zone system, which was an Ansel Adams thing. And mm -hmm. so everything has a certain tonality on the grayscale, right? Or at least we want to use that as a reference. And I like to try to build scenes, time permitting, that encompasses all of those tonalities so that it feels um, like it has some depth and some complexity to it, you know, visually. Now, so like you, you did, you came up as a, a still photographer. Is there a still photographer's work that you turn to for inspiration? not just for a specific show, but just for yourself in terms of. I started with, with still photography, um, you know, in school. And I went to a school called Brooks Institute that's no longer there. And it was really a well-known photography school. And I went there to study underwater photography, which was my initial passion. And in going to school, I, I was turned on to lighting and commercial lighting and this whole concept of painting with light. Um, and it changed my perspective. You know, I, I wanted to do, and I did work with like the Custo Society and I did a lot of underwater stuff, but it wasn't nearly as gratifying as, and, and, and I say there's a difference between taking pictures and making pictures. And I really like the idea of crafting things from the, from the start and building a scene um, through photography or cinematography, through lighting and camera work. And being a nature type of photographer, um, I don't think that's always the case. It definitely can be. Um, and a lot of that is being in the right place at the right time, which takes a ton of work. Um, especially the right time of day, put yourself in the right position for the lighting, but also you're not really in control of your subject matter. So it can be really challenging for those guys. Um, and then, so, so as far as a still photographer that I, that I really like, um, it's funny, there's a, there's quite a few of them. And, I, and I've been, um, I still like some of the Howard Schatz is an underwater photographer that um, has these beautiful images of of people in a really clear water column and, and he's surrounded all in black and it's really soft lighting and he uses things like silks or, or, you know, chiffon on his models that float in the water and give it this ethereal kind of angelic kind of, kind of look. And um, I find myself oftentimes just, just looking at those pictures um, and it really motivates me. I'd like to someday get back in the water um, doing kind of fine art photography. Um, it's just, it's challenged because of, you know, you have to have a pool. It has to be a controlled environment. Um, one of the interesting things about underwater work is that, and we did a bunch in Bly actually. Um, and I was so excited because it's right in my wheelhouse. And, <laughs> and I think some people can get intimidated by it, but I was chomping at the bit to get, to get involved with that stuff is one of the most important things is making sure that you don't introduce something into the water column that's going to pollute or contaminate it. Um, and, and that's really hard to do because every single thing that goes in there has to be cleaned prior a sandbag, a stand, a light, the, the actor's wardrobe. I mean, I've seen it where they bring a shirt in, whatever, and they go in the water and the dye from the shirt just starts to seep out into the water column. And, and there's, you have to wait to filter it all out again. And yeah. all these things need to be addressed, um, and planned for prior. Wow. I, when you were talking about water photography, I was thinking like you were going deep sea diving and getting like angler fish and stuff <laughs> well not angler fish that's pretty deep but um, yeah. yeah i did that a lot and when i was younger and we did a lot of like um, pinnipeds which are seals and sea lions um you know a lot of interesting sea life there's 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 so many different types of things to photograph in the in the ocean and one of the things that i really loved was the kelp forests yeah. you know a lot of people want to go to tropical diving places and see all these beautiful colorful fish i always found that these kelp forests were just magical and they the way the light would come through the the, the the water and be broken up by the kelp you'd have these shafts of light and i really enjoyed um diving and photographing in california i mean it's stunning what we have between you know san francisco and baja is amazing yeah now i have one last question for you you know we've been stuck inside or a lot of people have been stuck inside because of covid 
uh, and they've turned to the streaming services for entertainment. Is there a show or a movie you've discovered over the last year that they should check out? You know, I'm kind of, um, I kind of am a creature of habit and I watch sort of the same shows. One of the ones that I just watched that came out um, was the new season of Dexter. I was a huge Dexter fan. It kind of falls right into the kind of things I like with the mystery and the intrigue and the sense of jeopardy of him getting caught. And so I just finished that season. Um, one show that I had never watched that while I, while I was sequestered in Canada a lot for these shows um, that I binged was uh, Peaky Blinders. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had never really seen it. And I had the, um, the opportunity to work with Annabelle Wallace in, in the movie Annabelle. And, and, I, um, and she was a star in in uh, Peaky Blinders and I hadn't really watched that show and didn't know much about it and so I, I discovered it um, in quarantine and I mean I don't know how many seasons there are but I watched them all and I really really liked it again I'm, I gravitate towards period pieces I love you know every single thing that you see in the frame has been brought in or thought about it or designed um, I think it's it's amazing how production designers directors and, and, and director of photography really create these periods you know that that um that work and, and help sell the story so i really like peaky blinders a lot and if you haven't seen it i would recommend seeing it and there's tons you know there's several seasons so there's a lot of um there's a lot of material to dig through for sure yeah that's a great series well thank you so much for letting me interview you today thank you for having me back yeah and uh again um make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com for all our latest courses and of course follow us on twitter at filmmaker underscore you i'm gordon burkell thanks for watching Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.